We're here with Peter Richardson, who runs the American Studies program at San Francisco State and is an author who has written about various aspects of the 60s, including Grateful Dead, etc. Welcome and thank you for coming down and talking with us. It's my pleasure. So, of course, we're looking for that value that we can find from the culture of the 60s, the movement, the counterculture, etc. Do you see a lasting, resonating impact today in culture and society in general? I really do. I mean, I think that there's two ways to think about it. One is that the Summer of Love is a kind of culmination of things that were happening in the 50s and 60s. And, and then I think the second part of the story is what's happened since then and the, the effects that the Summer of Love has had on not just the region, the city and the region, but also American culture more broadly. And I, I don't really think you can understand the second half of the 20th century American history, that is, without understanding the counterculture. Mm, that impactful, that important. Right, and, I, and, I, you, know, if you, if, and you can't understand the, the counterculture without understanding what's ha what was happening here in San Francisco during that time. So, so I, I, I do think it's been very important, and I think you can draw a kind of straight line between what was happening in the summer of 1967 and what people are saying now about uh, so-called sometimes disparagingly as so-called uh, San Francisco values. And I think those hinge um, largely on a kind of um, effort during the 1950s and 60s to expand our, our political and our artistic and our sexual freedoms. And I think mm. if I had to sum it up quickly, it, it might focus on those three things. Mm. So what are these San Francisco values you're, you're referring to in there? Uh, tolerance, you know, sympathy, good mm. temper, mm. Uh, but mostly these freedoms, you know, and, you know, you can trace it in a number of different ways. You can look at these uh, court decisions that were coming down in San Francisco in the 50s and 60s. I mean, you could look at it culturally, the spread of um, organic food markets, um, recycling centers and other environmental efforts. Um, uh, rock festivals, there really were no rock festivals before the Summer of Love, and, and just the, the spread of those ideas from this region um, to, to the rest of America. It's, a, it's sort of our gift in many ways. Not, not to say that it was all bright side stuff, but there were a lot of things um, that came out of the Summer of Love and, and that period more generally that I think have real value and that are appreciated that way, a lot both of people, here and elsewhere. Right. A lot of people do consider it wonderful that we have that influence that spreads. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel uh, Monterey Pop, kind of first, one of the very first rock festival concerts. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe now, but I mean, because that was sort of already there when people of my generation were coming along. But I mean, really, San Francisco, um, you know, a very fairly small number of people, a couple hundred people sort of invented the conventions of the modern rock concert. I mean, you know, in 1966, when the Beatles came to Candlestick Park, they ran out in identical suits out to second base and played eight songs in 30 minutes and ran off, you know, with kind of teeny boppers screaming the whole time. That was rock and roll until the San Franciscans got their hands on it and invented the kind of conventions that we still have today. If you go to a rock show today, you're going to see much the same thing. Well, and the festival culture, of course, today is hugely influential and impactful, and it's a gathering place, gathering of the tribes, human being, 1967, et cetera, where people are coming together to sh spread ideology, share ideas, um, commune with each other, of course, network, and there seems to be a really, really growing, of course, the Burning Man, that type of festival culture as well, a really growing scene. I was going to mention Burning Man because I, one of the things my students at San Francisco State really resonate with is the, the fact that you can really draw a straight line from the Trips Festival of January 1966 to Burning Man today. And just knowing that history, I think, uh, uh, gives my students a little extra understanding of what this region is all about. What about some tangible lessons that we can take, carry forward from that time? We've talked about some of the influence, some of the values, the festival culture, and, and the birth of so many things that we still are flourishing today, of course. 
where's the, the, the value there that we can take from that through line and, and use to, to flourish the good side of the ideology, what they were getting at the openness, mm -hmm. the, the, the nurturing of others and the planet, the ecology, et cetera. Well, there's a lot of different ways um, we, can, we can follow up on that or lessons that we can take away from it. One of them is that you, there are no permanent victories. I mean, you're always mm -hmm. sort of working on it, keep trying to move it, move it forward. And um, I mean, just to, as, as one example, maybe not the best example, but I mean, people were fighting for or fighting against uh, the war on drugs here a long time ago. And, and a, a lot of people have recognized that the war on drugs, which started in 1972, was, was, was always a kind of uphill climb to the bottom that, that, that had pernicious political motives mm. and really is, hasn't done any, very many people very much good. Mm. And people here were fighting that very early on and proposing productive alternatives to it that you know, it took a long time for those ideas to get any kind of purchase at all, but it does seem to be an area of change that you can point to. It's amazing. I was just thinking, like, there's no winners in a war on drugs, and the drugs themselves probably don't care if we try and kill them. No, no, it doesn't seem like <laughs> It's it. a war on people, and yeah. when we go to war on people, especially innocent people who have chosen to ingest a substance in some way, right. do we, need we war against them? Well, that might be one example. I think you could point to a bunch of them when, when you know, bringing it back to this idea of the expansion of political, social, personal, artistic, sexual freedoms. I mean, there, there was a lot of resistance to that in the 50s and 60s. It, 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 it uh, uh, surprises my students that Neil Cassidy, for example, was sent to San Quentin prison for several years uh, for selling two marijuana cigarettes to an undercover San Francisco police officer. And how ironic, with all he had done, that's what he got busted yeah. for, two joints. <laughs> yeah, and when he got out, you know, the, the, the sort of first phase of the, the beat phenomenon was over and he had to find some new friends. And he, you know, he ended up falling in with Ken Kesey and, you know, one thing led to another. Kesey, of course, is a kind of connecting figure between the beats and the hippies. He becomes part of the Grateful Dead's cohort, so... It's a really rich history. Um, there's a lot of different facets to it, and that's what we're here at this conference to try to understand better. Mm, our understanding is deepening all the time, and these presentations have been so rich with, God, this, like we just heard from someone comment, this scholarly view of connecting the dots all the way from 18th century William Blake materials and the doors in the late 60s. Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons it's important to do that history is during, if you go back and look at the journalism on the hippies during that period, uh, you see that the, the stereotypes and the sort of um, sweeping moral judgments that were made very quickly and on very scant evidence in many cases mm -hmm. uh, doesn't hold up very well mm. to, to um, scrutiny now. But there were people here in San Francisco that were writing about of the San Francisco counterculture with a great deal of insight and appreciation. And so one of the things that we can do now is go back and look at some of that, some of the people who were getting it right in real time and, and, try, to fit, and, and try to hold that up so that it's not all just sort of the uh, national media um, disfiguring in mm. some ways. Yeah, I was gonna call it a vilification, but it, right. it really was. It is a, a disfiguring kind of, too. It was a kind of vilification. But um, can we go back and find writers that were doing things of real value during that time? I mean, the journalism during that period here in San Francisco was also very innovative. You get magazines like Ramparts Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, um, which really had profound effects on, on American journalism, not once or twice, but, you know, but for many years. Good yeah. point. How influential is Rolling Stone in our culture today? People read that. People are influenced by it. It has a whole history that, that you can study. And But I think those first 10 years when Rolling Stone magazine was here in San Francisco, when San Francisco was a global rock capital, I really, uh, really reward our study now. So that's one of the things that, that, that I've been doing and others and uh, it's one of the things that we're here to talk about at the conference. I guess what you're helping me realize and what I realize, well, what you're helping me realize now is that there are so many 
different things that influenced the world that originated here. We're, we've been such a beacon historically for people to come and check this out and find some wisdom here and, and participate in some culture that we're doing, that we started, that we initiated here, that was highly influential and resonated around the globe, perhaps. One thing you can you 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 can take away from this period and and sort of the major movements and events and figures is after the Second World War. I mean, San Francisco was always a little bit of a distant outpost, and and the the sort of artistic achievements that you see in painting, photography, sculpture, uh, theater, music, especially psychedelic posters. Um, almost always comes from a very small, vibrant, collaborative, do-it-yourself culture. And that's one thing you can say about the San Francisco Renaissance. You can say it about um, the hippies. And it's one of the things that I think are notable is that nobody was waiting around for some sort of official invitation to do something. That instead what you got were people that just did it. You know, sometimes without a lot of patronage, or support, they got their friends together and they started working on something that that they got energy from. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's I think that's an important aspect of of this region's culture, mm -hmm. and that that needs to be reinforced because uh, you don't get a permission slip to do these things. Mm -hmm. You just have to get together with your friends and start doing it. There you go. So if it's one major lesson to take away from the '60s counterculture in San Francisco, DIY. Don't wait for someone else. Make Very it much happen. so, yeah. I mean, that, that really, and then the influence that that has on the people that come behind, so that, you know, the, the way the beats um, influence people like Ken Kesey, who then influenced the Grateful Dead, and, or that you can follow these lines. And, um, but one thing they all have in common is, um, was this, this kind of intrepid, you know, forward progress, mm. not always with a lot of encouragement and, and, and facing real challenges with setbacks, uh, and, and, but just this sort of forward motion that, uh, that is really impressive. And, and one of the things you want to do now, looking back 50 years, is figure out which one of those enterprises was really durable and meaningful. Yeah. Some of them flash across the scene pretty quickly. Okay. That's fine too. You know, they don't. Not everything is built to last, but there have been some, some real durable achievements that I think we can point to as well. It's beautiful. And what about all the peace and love thing and the diggers' free spirit and taking care of each other and free food in the park and living communally? Well, that was really important. And one of the, one of the talks we heard today or yesterday on the back to the land movement was really a, a direct outgrowth of of that, and we're talking about millions of Americans that did it. That was a national movement, but it had a very interesting sort of local chapter. And, uh, and that's worth understanding too, and the kinds of effects that that has had on our culture and the way people have thought about uh, community, for example. Community is so important here in San Francisco because, um, as I say, you know, it wasn't a very competitive, um, aspirational culture it was always a matter of people getting together and, and supporting each other and when they did that good things happen mm -hmm. and you know but sometimes it fell apart or there were real setbacks as well but the the, the basic um the underlying values let's say of the beats and the hippies i think can still be seen in, in san francisco today and still need to be fought for I mean, you know, that, that's the thing that I mentioned earlier. There are no lasting victories. You're always going back and making sure that, mm. that, um, that some of these accomplishments can be sustained. Well, let's make a lasting victory out of it and proclaim ourselves you know, believers that we should take care of each other mm -hmm. and that they were on to something then and that a summer of love can be a, a forever of love. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it doesn't stop. I mean, it has to, it has to keep going, and I think that's... That's one of the legacies. I mean, my friend David Talbot has written about this, and mm, Season of the Witch, and Season of the right. Witch, and elsewhere. That you know, the, the the whole notion of San Francisco values was actually invented by its critics, um, people Thank who you. really <laughs> did not like what was happening in San Francisco. And it's important that David and others have kind of reclaimed those mm -hmm. values and are articulated them clearly, so that people can understand you know, what, what our contribution is to American culture, uh, both in 1967 and now. Mm, that's fine reasons to love our critics too. Mm -hmm.
Absolutely, yeah. They are legion. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great punctuation mark, too, and we appreciate your time, and we always love to wrap with a hug. Yeah.